Welcome to Thursday's edition of COVID-19. Efforts are underway to make the most of vaccines to enhance protection against the Delta variant. Now, one option is the adoption of booster shots. We have details on that later on the program. Here first is the pandemic update with our Kwonsoa. Now, so there's been a slight drop in daily cases here on the local front, but concerns, I understand, remain, of course. Yes, Sunny, it is a relief to see a decline this Thursday after we had an all-time high on a Wednesday. But with 1,674 infections, as Sunny said, remains uh, the concerns, of course, remain on a high level. And those infections include 1,632 domestic infections. And uh, in the past week, uh, cases were hovering between 1,300 and a little under 1,900. And with that, the number of of uh, domestic cases, the average in the past week now stands at above 1,500. Korea so far has accumulated more than 195,000 cases and has 2,085 COVID-19 related deaths. Now by region, this Thursday, we are seeing a downtick in many places, including the capital region, but still Seoul here at more than 500 cases. And then there's been some places in the southern parts of the country that have hit a milestone uh, this Thursday as Jeollanam-do province with 20 new cases hit over 2,000 infections in total. Gyeongsangnam-do province down here has over 7,000 cases as of this Thursday and Busan with 82 new infections uh, reached above 8,000 as of this Thursday. Now as most of the nation is currently under either level 3 or level 4 social distancing measures, there are doubts regarding the government's plan to get students from all grades back to their classrooms once the summer vacation ends. So here's the latest stance on this by the Education Ministry. We're planning to make an announcement on the academic curriculum by around the second week of August after gathering a pool of comprehensive analysis from health authorities and experts on the current situation as well as forecasts of the outbreak. Um, at least vaccination for educators is underway who are mainly being administered with Pfizer vaccines. And speaking of which, the vaccine makers recent data says that efficacy peaks at over 96 percent within two months after the second dose and then gradually declines to almost 84 percent four or six months later. And that is why booster shots are being discussed. Meanwhile, here in the country, we've now got seven million people who are fully vaccinated. It. Right. Meanwhile, on the international front, so Japan is marking a relentless rise in daily infections amid the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. That's right, Sunny. A record high of over 9,500 infections were reported in Japan on Wednesday, with the capital Tokyo breaking another record high for the second straight day with 3,177 cases. Uh, prefectures near the Olympic Coast City are also dealing with spiking figures, which is why they are concerned considering issuing new state of emergencies. And many countries in Southeast Asia are also struggling with new waves of infections. Thailand on Thursday uh, posted another daily high of 17,669 infections. Meanwhile, a UN envoy for Myanmar says that the country could become a quote, super spreader COVID state due to its weak healthcare system and also uh, being affected under being under social unrest following its military coup. Now, Myanmar posted a little under 5,000 infections on Wednesday and more than 330 fatalities. Another country in Southeast Asia still coping with high figures is Indonesia here seeing over 47,000 infections in the past 24 hours as of noon Korea time. And Iran is seeing resurgences with a total of 3.7 million, almost 3.8 million, surpassing Germany now with over 30,000 cases on a daily basis in recent days. And also due to these resurgences, the, the the total number of daily cases around the globe now here is also rising with over 712,000 infections reported in just a day. And those are the updates I have for now, but I'll see you back after the government briefing. Sunny? All right, so I thank you for now. Right, the fourth wave here on the local front is showing few signs of abating despite the level three and four restrictions in place nationwide. For more on the situation here, I have our Cho Won Jong in the studio with me. Welcome, Won Jong. Good afternoon. Right, so some health experts are entertaining the idea of introducing tougher measures to curb the latest outbreak, I hear. 
Right, so I talked to former head of KCDC, uh, now known as the KDCA, over the phone yesterday. Now, he told me that current social distancing measures need to be tightened to sort of counter the, the rapid spread of virus nationwide uh, before it's too late. Let's take a listen. I think it's time to enforce additional measures beyond level 4 social distancing. With infections now being reported in many regions outside the capital area, we need to impose greater restrictions in places with a high concentration of recent cases. Now, the health authority said Wednesday that the movement of people across the nation the past week rose by 0.8 percent compared to the previous week. It may only be a slight uptick, but authorities would like to see that figure on the decline given the latest situation. Dr. Zhang said imposing a partial curfew nationwide could help to stem the current fourth wave. To reduce the movement of people, a temporary stay-at-home order might be necessary, such as a curfew between 12 a.m. to 4 a.m. Many infections are taking place from illegal gatherings during unsanctioned business hours. Meanwhile, the health authorities on Wednesday also outlined a goal of bringing down the number of daily cases to below the 700s. They're also holding discussion on whether additional curbs are necessary if the current situation does not improve by next week. I see, by next week. Right, meanwhile, what's the latest, Won Jong, with regard to vaccinations for teachers within the academic arena? Right, so the, the education ministry wants to get all teachers uh, to be ready for in-person classes in the new semester starting this fall. That's why since uh, Wednesday, the vaccination began for more than 746,000 faculty members at schools nationwide. Uh, elementary and middle school instructors uh, teaching students between the third and ninth grades, as well as daycare center workers, are eligible to get the Pfizer vaccine. Now, the vaccination for this group of teachers will run through to August 8th. Kindergarten instructors and the, and the first and second grade teachers have already got their Pfizer shots, which were first handed out on July 13th. In addition, high school faculty members have also been vaccinated uh, with their inoculation in campaign having started on July 19th. Health Authority said the country's vaccination campaign will now move on to those under 15, with details set to be announced this Friday. Right, and staying within the academic arena, I hear we have new COVID-19 guidelines for international students seeking to study here in Korea. Right, so Education Ministry announced new rules which will apply to international uh, students uh, uh, for the upcoming fall semester. Now, in a nutshell, all students uh, must take three PCR tests before boarding a plane, uh, day after arrival, and at the end of quarantine. International students from 26 countries with serious Delta variant outbreaks are strongly discouraged from entering Korea for now until the country has vaccinated over 70% of its population. The countries on that list include South Africa, Brazil, India, Indonesia, Russia and other 21 nations. If students from these countries still decide to enter Korea, they're required to spend two weeks in quarantine. From January to June this year, 255 international students studying Korea have tested positive for COVID-19. Now, 33 uh, of those cases were detected at the airport and 222 were reported during quarantine. I see. All right, Won Jung, as always, thank you very much for the coverage. Thanks for having me. Right, it's time now for the regular afternoon briefing on the COVID-19 situation here in Korea for this Thursday. A vast majority of the nation is under level 3 restrictions until the 8th of August, in line with efforts to better contain the fourth wave, which appears to have expanded its borders beyond the capital region. Under level 3, a maximum of four people can meet for social purposes, with an exception for family members who reside together. Events including weddings and funerals, as well as rallies, can have up to 49 people in attendance. Also, concerts will be allowed only at certified venues. Indoor stadiums can host 20% of their capacity, while their outdoor counterparts face a 30% limit. Places of worship can host 20% of their capacity, and outdoor congregations can have up to 49 people. Businesses, including dining and drinking establishments, as well as gyms and cram schools, need to close doors to patrons at 10 p.m. Meanwhile, here's a look at the level four social restrictions in place here in the greater Seoul area, as well as a few other regions, also until the 8th of August. Up to four people are allowed to meet for social purposes until six in the evening, and after six, only two people can do so. To a large extent, this cap on gatherings also extends to family members who reside together. 
Weddings and funerals face a ceiling of 49 people. Also, only one-person rallies are permitted. Now, nightlife entertainment businesses, including bars and clubs, remain shut, while restaurants, cafes, gyms and concert halls are required to close doors at 10 in the evening with strict protocols in place with regard to seating arrangements, ventilation, face masks and visitor logs. Meanwhile, the academic arena has switched, of course, to remote learning in the case of um, programs scheduled for this summer. The briefing is about to start. We'll come back to you afterwards. Let us now begin our regular briefing for July 29th, Thursday, on the COVID-19 outbreak. And as of today at midnight, a total of uh, 18,382,137 people uh, have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, which accounts for about 35.8 percent of the total population here in the country. And we have 13.7 percent, or about 7 million million people uh, having a fully vaccinated. And as for the uh, college entrance exam takers, aside from uh, those who are enrolled in the third grade of uh, high school, we have been also uh, uh, receiving the vaccination appointments. And we have begin, uh, begun this process. And as of today, uh, midnight, uh, Today or early morning, we have about 84.4% uh, uh, of the vaccination appointments uh, reservation rate. And among them, the eligible recipients uh, have been uh, those who will be taking the test, uh, the college entrance exam, and also uh, some people who ha are uh, in the processes of uh, administration in relation to the college entrance exam. And also, we have seen uh, that is between the uh, August uh, in, in the early August we will be rolling out the vaccines uh, to these people as for um, the type of vaccine they will be receiving the Pfizer vaccines and as for the reservation you could do so via online and you could also designate the COVID-19 um, vaccination hospitals regardless of your registered uh, residential area and here are some updates on our updated updated uh, schedule for the supply of the vaccines and we also have uh, in schedule to arrive about 101,000 uh, Janssen vaccines uh, today and we have also uh, about 9 million doses of the vaccine to arrive in the month of July and we also have in schedule about 20 million doses to arrive in the month of August and as for the detailed schedules we will be disclosing the disclosing the detail based on close negotiation with the uh, drug makers. And we also have some updates on the screening by the uh, damage uh, uh, compensation team of the COVID-19 adverse responses. And we have carried out the latest screening meeting. And we have seen the cases that have been reported. And we have been seeing the correlation of these cases with the COVID-19 vaccines. We have looked at 551 cases. And and we have looked at the data and also medical data and also uh, previous uh, underlying illnesses and also other uh, data, including uh, the days until uh, these occurrences of the symptoms. And we have concluded that a total of 256 cases or about 46 percent of the assessed cases are deemed to uh, be subject to the compensation. And also, we have uh, been looking at the uh, adverse responses, and we have seen about 11 million uh, cases that have been uh, looking into these cases of the adverse responses. And we have looked at about uh, 1,500 cases that have been deemed as uh, some serious cases, and about uh, a uh, majority of these cases, among these cases, are have been deemed to be subject to the uh, compensation for the damage um, assessment. And we are also providing up to 10 million Korean won for specific uh, cases that are uh, currently under screened. Uh, and we have a total of 10 people who are uh, being subject to these uh, medical fee. And a total of four people have received their medical uh, uh, support 
support fee already. And for the rest of these uh, six people, we will also provide you with the compensation as soon as possible. And as for the new supplementary budget, we have also allocated new uh, areas of budget for the quarantine aspects. And on the 24th of July, we have been uh, seeing uh, the passage of the COVID-19 uh, of the uh, of these uh, so, um, supplementary budgets. Uh, that, and as of these um, among these budgets, we also have the allocated budget for the KDCA, which has been focused on um, the antivirus measures and also quarantine measures. And considering the antivirus measures, we have been seen uh, that th there has been a slight uptick in the number of um, in the amount of budget allocated for uh, for quarantine, and about 2.4 trillion Korean won has been um, dedicated for uh, the quarantine measures, and uh, this includes about 1.4 trillion Korean won for uh, the purchases of the COVID-19 vaccines from other countries, and we also have personnel, medical personnel um, fees, and also uh, the uh, compensation for these uh, people who are under the clinical trials. And we have seen uh, have seen uh, that there has been allocated of 1.5 trillion uh, Korean won for uh, the COVID-19 um, treatment, and we also these also include the test kits uh, and also uh, these um, paid uh, vacation leaves for who are on um, isolation, and also the treatment that are needed for isolated people and patients. And to this end, we see uh, that about we will have an increase of our budget to spending from 3.34 trillion won to about 6.3 trillion won for KDCA, and the KDCA will also exert our full efforts to be pr fully prepared so that there are no um, loopholes in executing our budget. And going forward, we will also make sure that there are and no uh, insufficiencies when it comes to the vaccination rollout in the latter half of this year, and we will also exert our full efforts to this end. And on a global level, we are also seeing resurgence of the virus, and here are some details. And as of today, midnight, we have 1,674 uh, local infections today, and we also have a total of 155,099 patients uh, here in the country accumulated cases. And we are seeing five-week increase of the cases globally, and especially surrounding the, uh, the Americas, and also the Pacific region and also in South Asia, we are also seeing increase of the budget, uh, increase of the uh, case total cases. And we also see a slight uh, increase in the number of fatalities as well. And in the U.S., we have seen an uptick in the number of daily cases for the past five uh, weeks. And this has been increasing by about 141 percent from the previous year, uh, while its fatality has dropped slightly. And France as well, they have seen also seen about 151 um, percentage increase of the daily weekly cases. And in Singapore as well, they have been witnessing an increase of the cases as well. And out of the seven fatalities, a majority of them uh, were not uh, vaccinated. And in Japan as well, centering around the capital city of Tokyo, they have also seen a rampant spread of the virus as well. And this has been on a slight uh, continued increase from the previous week as well. And starting here uh, and, and shifting our focus to uh, South Korea, uh, we have in schedule until August 8th to have the uh, level four social distancing measures in the metropolitan area and level three in the non-metropolitan area. The aim of these such stringent measures is to contain the curve of the virus and mitigate the virus spread here in the country. In order to, for us, uh, for our quarantine measures to be effective, we need uh, the par participation by the members of the public, and many people are already participating in such measures by uh, minimizing physical contact. We thank you once again for your efforts and participation. My thanks also go out to many medical staff members who are fighting on the forefront, and also uh, many uh, epidemiological investigators and government staff members as well. And the government will also spare no efforts. Thank you very much. 
Right, that was Pei Young Tech with Thursday's afternoon briefing, and I have Sua here back at the desk with the gist of his address. Right, Sua? Right, uh, and as Pei is uh, an official at the vaccination task force, uh, let's take a look at what he said uh, regarding the vaccination supply, the vaccine uh, supply that is. 101,000 doses from Janssen are set to arrive here in Korea today, and also uh, 9 million doses uh, by the end of July uh, will be supplied, and some 29 million doses are expected for uh, August. Now, the details will be announced based on the negotiations with uh, the uh, specific vaccine companies, he did say. Uh, also, uh, quite a large portion for the vaccination program is uh, coming from the supplementary budget uh, that recently has passed, uh, been passed at the National Assembly. Uh, he also had some mentioning about the global situation of the COVID-19 virus. There's been a rise in many countries around the world and also uh, fatalities in most countries. Uh, with that, he stressed that we here in Korea should also uh, not lose our vigilance, especially until August 8th, when the capital region remains under the toughest level four social distancing measures and the rest of the nation, most of them under level three. Right. All right. So as always, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Tongil Efforts to enhance the effectiveness of current COVID-19 vaccines are being explored by authorities around the world amid the threat posed by the Delta variant. For more on this, I have Professor Kim Mungyu from Yonsei University. Welcome back, Professor Kim. Thank you for having me. And I also have Professor Yu Byung-wook from Sun Cheng University. Good to see you again, Professor Yu. And joining the session virtually is Professor Jonathan Gershani at Tel Aviv University. Pleasure to have you with us, Professor Gershani. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Right, we'll start here in the studio then. Professor Kim, the Delta variant appears to be fueling the fourth wave here on the local front. What is your outlook? Uh, I think the portion of the uh, Delta variant is important. Uh, we never exactly know uh, the variant status unless we check all the patients with the variant subtype uh, special testing. One thing clear is uh, we should not be fooled by the numbers. Yesterday we had about, uh, I would say, 1,600 cases, and uh, let's say we can we can say that Delta variant is about half of them, but uh, Delta variant infection is more transmittable, and it's not the same number as uh, 2020, so they have more uh, potential to spread out to the uh, uh, population. More strict social distancing will easily stop the previous variants, but we don't know whether how it's going to be effective with the Delta variants. So uh, 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 I, we hear many news all, from all around the world, but I heard from Japan that they try to prohibit alcohol consumption in the public places, but they met with a very strong resistance. And uh, frankly speaking, I, I, I agree with that kind of strategy because uh, uh, nobody talks about this alcohol issue, but most of the transmission ha happens in the restaurant, pubs, and uh, uh, some karaoke and those places. That will be a, a, a big help if we can do that. And uh, uh, if we can do that for about some time, I think we we'll also can uh, booster the uh, vaccination speed and that will help to come down this fourth uh, outbreak. So tougher measures then? Yeah. Professor Gershoni, I believe Israel is 
fighting a similar battle amid the presence of the Delta. Do tell us a bit about the COVID-19 situation in Israel. Well, I, I unfortunately, I was watching your newscast just before going on air, and it sounds very similar to what we've experienced in the past in Israel. Uh, this is a global event. Nonetheless, uh, in Israel, we're very fortunate because we're a small country. And so, whereas I think Korea has already vaccinated more people than we have in Israel, it's a lesser fraction. So we have a population of 10 million, and therefore uh, we've been able to thus far vaccinate, I would say better than 60% of our total population, but more importantly, uh, 80 and maybe 90% of the older population, which seems to be more uh, sensitive and in danger. Uh, so we've had things pretty much under control. With the spike of Delta, we do see an increase in the numbers of infections. But I want to emphasize, I think that the vaccines are doing quite well. We've been primarily vaccinated with Pfizer. And people have to understand that the main objective of vaccination is to prevent hospitalizations and serious disease. And this, I think, we are all witness to amongst the countries and the populations that have been vaccinated, whereas we do see a rise in the number of infectees, we see still a rather controllable low number of hospitalizations and fatalities. And so we're trying to deal with it. This is a fourth wave. And in fact, Delta, I would say, is probably infecting about 50% of the cases in Israel. However, those that have been vaccinated uh, have a much, much, much better chance in uh, dealing with COVID-19. Uh, many of them are asymptomatic. Those that do develop symptoms are milder. And most certainly those that do end up having a breakthrough infection uh, and hospitalization, their chances are much better than the unvaccinated. I see. And staying with vaccines, Professor Gershani, last week health officials in the UK and their counterparts in Israel shared their respective findings on the protection offered by Pfizer against the Delta variant. Now, UK authorities claim Pfizer is 88% effective, while Israeli officials say it's 39%. How do you explain the discrepancy? Well, you know, the, the, the problem is this. Everybody is throwing out numbers. Now, let's assume, and I, and I totally respect and I believe that for each and every case, the calculation of the number was correct. However, one has to realize that different laboratories, different studies, different uh, groups of investigators are measuring different things. And so if we're looking at the endpoint, how much and how effective is the protection in preventing serious hospitalizations and disease, I think we're more or less globally in agreement that the protection of the Pfizer vaccination is certainly above 80%, and there have been numbers of close to 90% in preventing hospitalizations and serious disease. Now, on the other hand, when we start talking about the statistics about the rate of infection of the general population. We have to remember that in the beginning of the epidemic, primarily the diagnostics were, were done and conducted on symptomatic patients. And right now, because of the concern of the general uh, epidemic and the spread of Delta, we've gone into a new phase where we're generally taking PCR analysis and diagnostics of anybody who's entering the country. So we're beginning to see a rise, most certainly, in people who are infected, irrespective if they are symptomatic or not. So we're getting variations in the populations which are being studied and the numbers and the tests being done. So I, I wouldn't put too much weight on the fact that in certain small studies in Israel, we've seen a dramatic drop in the efficacy and prevention of infection. I think our numbers are still very high for protection against sim uh, symptomatic and, of course, hospitalization and severe disease. 
Uh, another thing that people end up measuring is the titer, the level of the antibody. And we do know that the antibody levels are waning over time. This is a classic 101 immunology. Uh, but what people are not taking into consideration is the efficacy of the uh, call of our immune response in memory. And we immunologists and scientists, I'm not a physician, I want to stress that. But as a scientist, we know that much of the protection with respect to development of disease is based on the memory response. And uh, this, the, the level of antibodies are tighter, uh, is not necessarily immediately correlative. So it, it's a complicated picture. However, my take home message uh, as a citizen of the world not necessarily of Israel, that too, is that the vaccines thus far are proving to be very effective in preventing serious disease. And therefore, people should be encouraged to get vaccinated. That is the most effective means. And then, of course, all the rest of social distancing and mask donning and so on is all helpful. But if we can get that message out that people should get vaccinated, that would be the most effective way in curbing and dealing with this epidemic. Right. As complicated as it may be, your words are comforting though. And back here on the local front, Professor Yu, authorities here have decided to stretch the dosing interval for the Pfizer vaccine from three weeks to four weeks. What can you tell us about the impact of this decision on overall protection against COVID-19? Well, best is to, we should follow the what interval we just designed it. Pfizer should be three weeks and the Moderna four weeks and AstraZeneca in the four weeks as well. But we can think about it first. So in general principle of vaccination program, so like a, one person who wanna go to Africa, but who must be done to hepatitis B vaccination three times. So they have to do the month apart and the six months later to the last one, but we don't have enough time. So that's why we have the two principle minimum age and minimum interval. So mini today I'd like to talk about minimum interval. Minimum interval means we need the time to develop it antibodies, which is against the work to the virus. So we need at least three weeks, case of the Pfizer, the four weeks for the Moderna, which is the minimum interval. But a little bit prolonged this interval, so which is the, we still need the evidence, but still until now we have the good answer. So. I'm so worried about uh, Pfizer's vaccination because of from three to the four weeks, I can't say no worry about it. But who person, I have to go to some place which is very dangerous because of COVID-19. This is why I wanna have it now. And the second one is three days later, I am not recommended because it's broken about the minimal interval of the general principle of the vaccination in general. But let's back to talk about COVID-19 vaccination. Yes, that is true. So design one is the best, but a bit delayed it, so there are no problem. Because minimum interval means we need time to get the developed antibody, but three to four weeks, there are no problem. Even the AstraZeneca one, so you know, following research said, so it, which is the design is like the four weeks interval, but coming now six to 12 weeks interval is, is more better. So you know, certain the schedule can be changed is following research. Right. Professor Kim, cross inoculation is also underway here in the country, and those who receive their first dose of AstraZeneca vaccine are now being offered the second dose of, a, of the Pfizer vaccine. Mm -hmm. What has been shared thus far about the potential side effects, perhaps, of cross inoculation? We have about four reports regarding this issue, and I would like to mention a little bit about it. Uh, there was a report from UK, and the name of the study is ComCov. They uh, include about uh, 400 some patients and uh, they say that there are more side effects if you mix and match uh, vaccines like you, ha you have the first shot with AstraZeneca, second one with Pfizer. You might have more fever, you might have more myalgia, but uh, uh, severe side effects are similar and uh, you have a similar immunogenicity even though you change to a new one. Uh, the second one I would, I would like to mention came from Spain and they included about 670 patients and the name is uh, Combivax and uh, they compared two groups. First group is the uh, AstraZeneca one dose compared with AstraZeneca plus 
Pfizer, and they say that if you uh, have two shots, they have more immunogenicity, which is uh, naturally we can expect. And there are some German reports that uh, the, uh, they compared with Alpha variant and Delta variant, and they say uh, Delta variant might ha not have uh, enough immunogenicity compared to Alpha variant. And the, uh, the last study from C Canada is not reported yet. So uh, if we want to follow this strategy, uh, we should not just copy and paste. I mean, uh, because we have to respond to a new situation, new variants in the future. So I would like we could, uh, we could accumulate our own uh, uh, data. Uh, and uh, this mix and match strategy was not thought at the beginning. It just happened because supply issues and many other things. Uh, mostly it came because, because of the lack of vaccine supply. So uh, I wish that uh, this ex experience let us make a better vaccine in the future and uh, we should have our own data to uh, compare in the future. Right, of course. Professor Gershoni, Israel has also become the first country to approve COVID-19 booster shots for immunocompromised adults. Could you tell us a bit more about this, please? Well, Again, it's due to the fact that we uh, have very high level of uh, vaccination uh, and we've started very early. So, for example, I personally was vaccinated in uh, late December and I got my second shot in January. And so a period of six months has been uh, quite reasonable and people have been protected. But as we follow the situation in Israel, we're seeing that some of the breakthrough vaccine infections is more uh, prevalent amongst the older population, that is to say those that were vaccinated early. And so uh, the notion is, is that there is some drop in efficacy. So we are considering generally of giving a booster shot. However, this, as you know, has not been approved as yet by the FDA, I, I agree with Dr. Kim that each country should make its uh, own uh, decisions, analyses, and studies. And so, therefore, in Israel, despite the fact that FDA has not necessarily approved generically a third shot, we started uh, about a week ago to initiate a third boost to those individuals who need it most, that is to say immunocompromised. Now, there is a point here that we have to make because people who are immunocompromised, they actually were not very efficient in mounting protective immunity from the get-go. So they uh, have been recognized as benefiting greatly with a third boost. And so that's why we've initiated without hesitance and without waiting for uh, FDA or other approval. The current discussion in the country is if we've already approved booster for the immunocompromised, and that might be people of organ transplant or undergoing uh, cancer therapy and so on, should we consider boosting those who actually responded quite well with the first two injections? And this is currently a debate. Uh, however, I think that yesterday, there was a meeting of the uh, expert committee that advises the government, and the decision was made that yes, we should initiate a third boost policy for at least the older population from 60 and above. And my personal feeling is, I think this is certainly reasonable. I would want to see, we still have about a million two hundred thousand people in the country who have not been vaccinated. So I think that a major effort has to be made to try to convince them. But these are already people who have had the opportunity and have chosen not to. So it's, it's a difficult audience to convince that you really need to get out there. In the interim, with the availability of our vaccinations, can we add another layer of protection to the older population? I think we can. I think we should. Now, I'm not totally oblivious to the social and international debate. Is it right to start to implement a third boost 
while there are many, many countries and people who haven't received their initial protection and vaccine. And so this is a serious and, and a justifiable debate. However, as a scientist, thank God, I don't deal with policy. And right. so therefore, I don't have to uh, deal with the ethical issues, the political issues, but rather with the uh, scientific based decisions. And yes, a third boost should enhance the level of our antibody level, the, the tighter, and this should definitely translate into an additional level of protection. And therefore, I think it's a good idea. Right. Professor, your authorities here in Korea, for their part, have left uh, booster shots and option on the table, but they add that it will only be discussed after more than 70% of the population has received, has been fully vaccinated. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I 100% agree about it. It's not only political issues, because the rest of the many Korean people is not inoculated yet. So we can talk about how we can deal over the boost of vaccination. I'm strongly support in the, according to the scientific evidence, I like to support in the booster shot. Yes, for me, like AstraZeneca when I done twice. So the cross match in the booster, probably messenger RNA one, I expecting haven't it. So the other one, other way, who are done in messenger RNA one, like uh, Pfizer and Moderna, expecting the cross match or additional messenger one. So it is, we should see that. But anyway, current situation in Korea should be done at least 70 to 90 percent of total occupation program for Korean population and the who resident in Korea. And then we can discuss about the booster shot for later of this year or early of this early of next year. Right. Professor Kim, how do you respond to calls for a second shot for those who receive the Janssen vaccine? So there have been some studies that claim it's less effective. Janssen is basically the same, similar as uh, AstraZeneca, and they give only one shot. And uh, the efficacy is reported to be 40, uh, 80, 85 percent. But if uh, we just uh, uh, see the uh, severe cases, the uh, uh, efficacy is about 93 percent. And for the uh, moderate and mild cases, it goes down to 68. But uh, WHO does not give any guidelines about uh, the efficacy invariant yet. Uh, the incidence of breakthrough infection in Korea almost reached 700 cases. And if we change this number to a case per 100,000, uh, breakthrough infections happens after Janssen vaccination is about 38. And the second is the AstraZeneca 17. And Pfizer has only about five cases per 100,000 cases. But uh, as Professor Gaussian uh, uh, mentioned, uh, only 0 0.5 case went to severe cases. That's a good news. So uh, um, if, we, uh, if, if we think about the mortality, uh, the breakthrough infection is not a big deal, but if we are block the infection spreading out to the population, uh, Yansen might ne need another uh, shot to have an effect. Right. And Professor Gershoni, going back to the idea of booster shots, do correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand authorities in Israel are debating on whether to provide booster shots for all or to wait for perhaps a new tweaked vaccine. Where do you stand on this debate? Personally, I don't think we should wait, but not because of urgency, but rather because of biology and science. The semantics in naming each mutant as if it's a different and completely new identity is a bit misleading to the general public. If we look at the molecular structure of Delta as compared to Alpha, Beta, and the Wuhan, the the variations are very slight and minor as far as the mass of the antigen, if you will, that protein which we want to direct our antibodies against. So if we're talking about a protein whose size is 1,200 amino acids, and the whole difference between Wuhan and the Delta variant is two or three, maybe four residues, amino acids, then for the most part, I think an effective antibody response against the original Wuhan is also quite effective 
against the delta. So what is the difference, you may ask? And I think that the main difference is, is, albeit the changes are very small, but they do have a profound impact on the efficiency of delta in infecting human cells. And therefore, the flux, the number of viruses that are out there, the viral load in delta is markedly higher than what we see for, let's say, the Wuhan original virus. And so therefore, the infection rate is greater. But I think that the antibodies directed against the original vaccine and what might be a tweaked new modified vaccine, I do not believe that there is promise that will all of a sudden affect because the, the real problem with Delta is not its molecular structure, but rather its rapidity and uh, ability to transmit. And, and this will not be affected by modifying two or three amino acids in the vaccine. So I would not wait for a Delta-focused vaccine, but rather I would prefer to save people and protect people as early as possible. Right, to make the most of the current vaccines then if possible. All right, Professor Gershoni, thank you very much for your thoughts and your time today. Professor Kim here in the studio, thank you for being with pleasure. us as always. Thank you. And Professor Yu, thank you for your words today. Right, now that is all the time we have for this edition. Do seek to make inoculation and social distancing your first line of defense against COVID-19. Thank you for watching. See you on Friday.